was funded by the Grants Portugal. It's been a roller coaster since it started in 2019, but then we had the pandemic. Uh, with me, I have uh, Gro, my colleague from TI Norway, whom I thank you very much for all the help, the assistance, and the interest in, in developing this project. And also my colleague Tor from TI Iceland, uh, whom I also thank for all the, the support and the interest in the project as well. So Clean Bees is a, a small initiative that we decided to, to develop together. And because we always thought that one of um, the key features of our work as Transparency International National Chapters is to promote awareness and to develop knowledge and research and engagement, public engagement and stakeholders engagement in topics related to corruption, wrongdoing, but also transparency, integrity issues that we think are key. And for us, corruption in international trade uh, as it is uh, determined by the OECD convention, sometimes is missed from day-to-day -day operations from companies, especially the companies that work abroad. And we think this is uh, uh, of the utmost importance because corruption prevents uh, um, the fulfilling of human rights and it, uh, ha it constitutes an obstacle to, to sustainable development and to the 2030 agenda of the United Nations, as you know today, a conference of the UN is being held, the conference on oceans. So I'm also very glad that we have here with us people that do understand uh, the impact of corruption um, in the fishery sector, for example, uh, that we thought also will be discussed during, during the conference. So um, I thank you all for, for being here. And we are initiating our first panel uh, the panel will be moderated by by Gro. Is the first panel on the impact uh, by Tor? Sorry, it will the impact of businesses in human rights and sustainable development. So very specifically, and then we have the coffee break and the second panel on preventing corruption and bribery in international trade, the role of companies, and I think this is also a very good opportunity for professionals and people interested in compliance issues. Uh, to be aware of what are, you know, the, the latest developments on, on this field, but also uh, for the general public to understand uh, how uh, business compliance uh, can be strengthened, also to protect the livelihoods of our livelihood here in the global north, but also and especially the live livelihood in the global south, where uh, um, companies also, also operate. So thank you very much. I will pass uh, the, the session to tour right now, and I will ask to join us Ines Crispin Ribeiro from NOVA uh, Center for Business, Human Rights, and the Environment. Uh, also, Joanne Estefanson, whistleblower from the fish rod case, and Luis Paes Bernardo, do CESA ISEG, uh, and the Faculty of Economics of the University of Coimbra. Thank you so much, and see you in a while. So, should I move over there? Sure. Yeah. their work. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you guys. Iceland is sort of the baby in the group. We are the newest chapter, so it's been very useful for us to participate in this. So if should we just get right into it, and I wanted to ask all of you to take a 
a minute or so just to kind of introduce you, yourself starting on this end here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone, thanks for the... Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks for the invitation. My name is Luis. Um, I teach history at the University, the University of Coimbra. Sorry, I'm a bit tired. I gave an exam at, uh, at 9 a.m. <laughs> back in Coimbra and I'm here now, so yeah. Uh, and I'm also, I think this is probably more relevant to this seminar. I am a research associate of the Lisbon School of Economics and Management. Uh, that condition I'm, I have been researching private sector uh, activity in global development and uh, my particular interest right now is private sector operations in regional development banks. So I've also been uh, with CI Portugal since its inception. I'm a co-founder, so I have a long-standing interest in issues of uh, compliance and anti corruption. No. Maybe now, yeah. yes. But, hi everyone, my name is Ines Crispin. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I'm here as an associate researcher It's a new model of interactive center that was created between reading on the school of law by Gregor, our director. Uh, and uh, this, this convocation of the center focuses on two main goals. Uh, the first one uh, is to perform and uh, disseminate high quality research uh, to foster responsible business conduct between Portugal, Europe, and Africa. Uh, we uh, are members focus on scientific publications, but uh, they have uh, also uh, participated in studies and reports addressed to uh, human bodies. And uh, you can also find in our website this uh, practical guide and legal briefs and um, Also, Also, uh, the center serves to develop uh, awareness, awareness raising and influencing the public on these <coughs> issues on how to take responsibility for science. We are very active at the to, uh, at organizing conferences and webinars. We are also preparing to training the best two companies regarding ESG and security and human rights. And you can also serve as a question question to answer the experience that has been shared. Good day, everybody, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be invited here. My name is uh, Johannes Stemosson. I'm a whistleblower in a corruption case called Fishrot involving uh, Icelandic uh, fishing company and uh, Namibian ministers and officials. Uh, the Fishrot corruption uh, took place in Namibia from 2012 to 2019. I left in 2016, reported the case in, uh, to authorities in Namibia in 2018, and uh, <coughs> media exposure was in the end of 2019. Fishrod is about uh, misuse of power in, in Namibia with the two ministers and officials and business people for uh, to uh, give, uh, give uh, fish quotas to the fishing company summary. And the fishing company summary went in there and they could get access to the fishing companies and they would meet and take everything out, all the profits out of the country and leave lots of behind. All right, so you, um, Johannes, you keep your mic because I'm going to go directly and ask you a question. So if you have any questions or anything, obviously, you're welcome to raise your hand and we'll try to be um, accommodating and, and, and free flowing for this. But as you might notice, uh, Johannes has a different background than the rest of the panel. And one of the reasons why we wanted to include him is that he can describe the impact a little bit from the, the other side of, of the coin. Uh, I think Johannes is going to be okay with me saying that, I mean, you were, an inst you were a tool in this corruption until you uh, became a whistleblower, you participated in it. So I'm going to go right there and ask you to kind of elaborate a little bit some of the impact that you saw in Namibia. 
Presentations that we will build up in Namibia with to get so many jobs. And you know, this uh, the company is big, you know, it's a very, really big business company worldwide. You know, that's from Iceland. And you know, I was probably the only person who believed we were actually going to do it within the company. And uh, you know, my I was screaming forward that we were actually going to build up in the company and create jobs. And so you kind of looked away. From uh, financial times, the bright payments and uh, tax evasions and so on, because you were hoping that something good will come out of it. Uh, from 2014 to 2016, and I left in 2016, I was actually very frustrated because uh, there were a lot of other all the promises and agreements with the people to build up and see sustainable future for the people. And, and uh, so I left in 2016. And uh, it is like uh, one and a half year later. And my conscious is starting really telling me this is not good for what we were part of. Because the point here is that I was following what was happening in Namibia. I'm watching the increase in unemployment rate in Namibia. Today it's 50%, and the fiscal corruption has contributed a lot to it. 40% uh, of the people living in shacks, which is one million people in Namibia. You see problems like sanitation, access to food, water, and uh, and uh, housing, and you see this, and this is where you, uh, my conscious kick in that something needs to be done and changed because I'm watching this, and this is what affected me to do what I do. And today, it's very well known fact that you know the fiscal corruption has uh, contributed a lot to this uh, uh, increase of unemployment and, and other factors. This makes uh, people difficult to live because you know the livelihood of uh, tens of thousands of people have been affected. Uh, this is the piece of the GDP report that there are up to 27 suicides uh, of fishermen which have lost their jobs due to the corruption. Due uh, to the fiscal corruption. And uh, this is, uh, you know, maybe the small number because the number is much bigger. It's the uh, lives have been destroyed. I don't talk about it. Some people, and it's just terrible stories. Losing their houses, cars, livelihoods, have to take the children and away from the schools. Uh, the man who was the breadwinner for the home, you know, he cannot uh, maintain the home or the family. Uh, families break up. So it, it has been having that devastating effect. All right. So, um, yes or no question. At the time, did you. Did you did you understand what you were doing and you were in denial or did you um, kind of push it away? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I understood very well that I was breaking the law because I also had to be careful. And you are somehow dragged into this mentality of the IMD company. They are the victims, they need to get more from the NEP as possible. You know, the company is suffering but still making huge profits. And you know, I'm working for this huge company, and it's like, okay, you, this is how you do business. You know, I'm not who was fully aware of the crimes. And you know, I was even trying to hold back, you know, because I was a general man a managing director for the companies. So maybe not go too far in this. But uh, I, I was paid a part in this. And, and you know, it, it is a process then after I left in 2016 to understand what you actually been part of. There is one thing that is happening, you know, like, like I said, fully aware of breaking the crimes, you know, breaking the law. I mean, there is no doubt when you're carrying maybe 40,000 US dollars in, in this court bag into a hotel room to deliver it. It's very obvious you're breaking the law. So if you don't understand the consequences of your action, then it's happening. But you justify it because you were going to build up. So it's some kind of mind game which you always see in your head. Well, yes, I knew I was, but I was not. Mm -hmm. All right, Ines, you'll get the, the, the easy task of following up there. But, um, <laughs> but hearing from this side of it, that, like the effect of it and how there is. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, the effect of it, how uh, that you, you, you on some level understand what you're part of, but you don't understand the impact. Do you want to maybe follow up and? and explain 
a little bit what you do and the impact of it? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, I think what was just said can really show the impact that companies can have in human rights and how corruption can hinder the respect for human rights. And I think I think this shows the importance of the new hard laws that uh, are being approved now about uh, human rights due diligence um, for those, uh, well, uh, some uh, national level laws have been approved now uh, and that uh, demand companies to perform human rights due diligence on their activities, also in their supply chains and their group. And uh, there's a draft proposal that has been approved, uh, that uh, has been approved and is expected to be uh, the directive is expected to be approved in 2024. That will demand large companies uh, to do this kind of due diligence as regards human rights and environmental impacts throughout their value chains. As for due diligence, I do not mean the traditional due diligence that companies usually do to assess if a certain activity or investment has an impact in their value. No, it's the other way around. How can a company and their activity impact uh, the human rights and uh, the environment. Um, well, these, uh, uh, these laws will only be applicable to large companies, but since it will require those companies to do the due diligence process around their supply chain, uh, it will affect all the companies in the supply chain. Uh, the, these, uh, these laws do not uh, directly require to do a corruption due diligence, Um, do you have any opinion on on the on the importance of uh, understanding the human right impact for our work, like anti-corruption? Because it's it's quite it seems blatantly obvious how these two are connected, but you still meet often a little bit of resistance. This idea that these are completely separate issues. Even though I'm sure for everyone in here, it seems very obvious. For corruption can prevent the rule of law and the enforcement and supervision of the human rights and the environmental problems. Uh, and I don't think the company can uh, say that uh, they actually assess their impact if they do not have a sound corruption, corruption process in place. Also, uh, countries and sectors that have a, a higher level of corruption are, are also connected with higher level of environment and human rights. Uh, and, uh, I'm really, really happy to see that uh, the European Union is now approving a new set of hard laws on this issue that will affect company workers and will make the companies not responsible for their impact. Luis, um, you told me before that your research into interest is um, private sector in global development. Uh, so I'm assuming that you can offer us some insights here. But can you um, set some light and maybe respond to um, also the, the, Johannes' description as someone that was sort of in it and didn't fully understand the consequences? Uh, I'm not sure how I can, uh, I, I, can I'm speechless, so I, I, I feel the need to just give the, the mic back to Johannes <laughs> so that he can uh, continue his reflection. Uh, anything that I have to say will seem more or less uh, dry academic <laughs> um, input, but I'll try anyway, because I would really like to hear more about uh, what, uh, what you just shared. So just to give a little bit of, uh, of context. Um, it seems um, it seems more or less uh, taken for granted that the private sector is the centerpiece of global development. But it's actually uh, um, an, an evolution coming from the Millennium Development Goals and now the SDGs, the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah, uh, 2015. Is it off or?
All right. Should I, should I wait for the mic? Uh, I think we need to wait because of the streaming, right? Okay. Yeah, or you can be, oops. Maybe you can just borrow mine for a little bit. Oh, well, he's doing it. I'll use the opportunity then and get my phone so I know the time because I know, sorry about this. So yeah, perfect. I, I can hear my voice now. Yeah. So uh, I was talking about the SDGs, and uh, it seems more or less clear that uh, though there remain a lot of challenges with regard to to private um, the participation of the private sector in global development, it is entirely necessarily. It, it is actually um, the SDGs are clearly not viable without private the private sector, which puts um, makes the the whole conversation a little bit different from what it was 20 years ago 25 years ago because although it is entirely recognized that the private sector is the centerpiece of global development there remain a lot of regulatory insufficiencies with regard to how the private sector actually um, is actually leveraged to obtain development and I want to focus specifically not so much on anti-corruption, but on transparency and accountability. Um, there's uh, probably the, the most important um, policy piece, apart from the binding treaty on uh, business and human rights and those uh, more uh, formal um, formal arrangements. The, I don't know if uh, you know, but you probably know this, that there's this thing called the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation. And the, that partnership, the, the global partnership, as it were, has five principles, which are called the, the Kampala principles. And the, one of the, those principles is the principle of, of transparency and accountability. The problem is nobody is actually sure as to how corporate compliance and corporate disclosure operates at the global level, because uh, for those of us who, who've worked in um, for a number of years of years on um, corporate disclosure, it, it is probably the most one of the more opaque areas in transparent global transparency. Um, it is very hard to obtain credible knowledge about uh, any number of issues. Actually, we, we can talk about supply chains and talk about global value chains. And I have a number of, uh, of questions uh, questions with regard to that. We at, um, at the, Le the Lisbon School of uh, Economics and Management do a lot of work on private, uh, on blended finance. So basically it's the pooling of uh, public and private capital to obtain uh, development results. And this is a very challenging thing because that is also private finance is the actual lever that people are relying on to get to 2030 and obtain the SDGs. The problem is once you try to untangle or open the black box of blended finance, nobody knows what's there. So a lot of questions remain. I, I, I would want to ask uh, Johannes, um, what, are the, what, what were the, the financial workings in your, in your jobs? Because this is something that, that is very, very interesting to us, finance, in global development is, a, uh, is not, not as opaque as other areas of global finance, but it is strikingly opaque. And uh, I will finish my, my uh, contribution now. There's another thing that I, want, uh, that I wanted to, um, to share that uh, pertains to this. So we tend to speak about global development and the SDGs as a sort of global agenda that produces results which drive uh, development results upwards. So prosperity is shared, everyone get, gets better. The problem is once you look at uh, actual results with regard to, to development, fragile states, fragile societies are actually being left behind. And that's specifically because the private sector is the centerpiece of global development today. And that, uh, that for me is, uh, is problematic. Yeah, that's 
I really want to hear more of what you have to say. Yeah. Do you want to follow up on that, Dionis, and maybe explain a little bit the case? Because the physio case is unusual for the fact that it's a separate issue on itself, how much evidence we have. That's actually the complicated part. Yeah. Do you want to ex explain a little bit about the scheme? Yeah, I mean, you were talking about just the financial numbers in this and uh, how to explain the size. Maybe we can explain the size, you know, is that uh, the Financial Intelligence Center in Namibia has flagged uh, 700 million US dollar as related to the fish road case. And in the fish road corruption, there are uh, several side corruption. So it's a whole corruption. And uh, we are probably looking or we estimated numbers with uh, the Icelandic fishing company and the fish road accused in Namibia has pocketed uh, these are several hundreds of millions of US dollar. So maybe if we explain that, you know, I think uh, the last year uh, the G uh, GDP in Namibia was around 12 billion US dollar. So it, it has a big effect. And then it's not only, um, it is one thing when the corruption, this corruption scheme stops, but is it actually stopped? because it continues in a different form. So, I mean, this is a really long road ahead to unfold this because law has been changed to be able the corruption to be facilitated. So there, as I sort of say, they try to legalize the illegality. So, I mean, uh, yeah, so the, these are quite big numbers for the North Africa nation like Namibia, and there are like 27 countries involved in one way or another because of their companies which uh, they accused fish rot accused in namibia and Icelandic fishing company they have companies in different uh, countries so they're talking about 27 countries somehow involved in the the the, the financial uh, flow the illegal financial flow and uh, yeah was, i think is there at least 15 million us dollar paid in bribes but that is not maybe the, the biggest. I think the biggest is how much uh, the Namibian society and Namibian economy lost because, you know, also the Icelandic fishing company did not pay, paid only very little taxes because they uh, conduct, you know, tax evasions by with inflated invoices, uh, dodgy agreements and so on, just to take the money out. Yeah, so um, um, Ines, okay. Because since we have the honest here and, and like he can explain from that side, but maybe can you set some light on what would be the indicators that you could see as part of the impact if we're trying to see from the outside, what, what are the indicators that we are uh, looking for in terms of understanding the impact of um, corruption like this? Do you have any thoughts on it? First of all, I'm still speechless with what I'm hearing. I'm sorry. Uh, well, um, I think the we can see that this has been affecting the the country and especially the less the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, it will affect their the provision of essential services. It will uh, affect the access to jobs, uh, and uh, well. It will even affect the access to information and to real data because probably the the real problem is not uh, uh, being disclosed because of the problem of corruption. So I think this will affect the whole development of the country and especially the most vulnerable ones. Uh, the and uh, well um, and I think it will also affect the the confidence in how we can develop this. So. The corruption will be the first problem that will have to be tackled before we can start developing the sustainable development goals and start achieving all the the goals that he, it uh, looks for. Uh, do you want to add anything, um, Luis? Well, I want to have I want to add a lot of things, yeah. but. Um, I, I do think that corruption is certainly one of the foremost issues in global development, but uh, we also, I, I think at least, we need to consider carefully um, how the global economy is organized 
nowadays because we can talk at length about corruption, but we also need to, to think about distribu distributive justice in this sense. Um, Inish was talking about the ESGs, ESG, and I'm particularly, particularly interested in the G of ESG, the governance side. The problem tends to be, uh, I was uh, at a, a book launch two years ago about uh, the greening of uh, the greening of capitalism in the world of global value chains. And the problem is, the problem is not necessarily that of uh, greening the global economy, is the, the problem that leading players in global value chains tend to push costs onwards or, um, yeah, one could say onwards to uh, their suppliers, which leads us to a very difficult question as, questions as to how do small-scale suppliers in the global south deal with the increasing need for certification and certificates and the need to comply with, with a number of uh, requirements and regulations without going out of business. So that's the, the reverse of uh, anti-corruption because complying with anti-corruption uh, regulations when you're a, a small-scale supplier anywhere in the global south puts uh, puts that supplier, that business, um, face to face with very difficult questions as to how it will survive, and those costs are not borne by uh, by the um, large scale transnational or multinational corporations. So that, that I'm trying to play the devil's advocate here, even though I'm a long-standing activist in this uh, in this domain. But I think this needs to be considered as well. And this, this is not a, an easy thing to, to talk about, I think. At least I think so. All right, so we've talked a little bit about corruption and we are getting to uh, the, human rights, uh, the human rights impact. Um, but this is the point that is so obvious. Without dealing with it, we, cannot, we don't have the capacity to um, to improve. Um, there's one thing that I wanted to do, Jonas, because in, in this uh, room, there are some people that know about the Fisher case, but as someone that has followed it um, for a while, I think it's important that we explain the scheme. Uh, so if you can take the mic, I'll start by explaining the very basics and you can then follow up. Uh, so it, it surrounds a company, uh, the largest fishery company in Iceland, and a large one on a global scale. They have operations in multitude of countries. Uh, exactly where can be a little bit difficult to uh, to state because they are quite secretive about they yeah the information isn't very reliable, and they are uh, of immense uh, political influence in Iceland. Uh, they decided to go to Namibia, and Namibia was a bit of a chance because they looked into other countries as well. And in the process of securing quota in a country that didn't have any available quota, I mean, it had already been, I think it was already uh, found the need to get close to the government uh, and paid fees to family members of ministers and ministers in both Angola and Namibia had international law changed. They were able to capture state companies, capture state um, <clears throat> state institutions. All the while they made uh, promises of grant investment in the country, while the scheme also involved making sure that no tax, as little tax as humanly possible would be paid. In Iceland, so that's that's sort of the the scheme, you could say. So it, it is quite grand, and it involves buying off politicians. But maybe you want to add on to it, because then we add on to the description, because then we can uh, talk about the impact, the human right impact that, that we are now starting to understand from this case. Yeah, I, I think you explained it quite well, you know, because it's about the misuse of uh, power with the. Uh, with the ministers and, and the opposite. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think you explained it quite well because it's about the misuse of power in Namibia and, and also in Angola. 
by ministers and officials for the Western company, in this case, Icelandic fishing company, to gain access to the resources of, uh, of Namibia and uh, to have access to lucrative fishing quotas with, uh, with uh, lower prices than uh, the market prices. And uh, the, you know, the big scheme is probably the, what will be the, what uh, they have gained, the Icelandic fishing company have gained from this because uh, they took everything out of the country and left basically nothing there for any sustainable developments and, and, and future for the people. So from what we know, we do believe that 18,000 jobs were lost in the country because of this, according to the local unions. Uh, 18, 18 suicides probably linked to it. Yeah, I think that there are, there talk about, there are, there are 27 suicides reported and most of them are linked to the, the fissure of corruption. Hmm. And uh, the 18,000 jobs is probably going to go or the people affected is probably going to go higher. So there we have an example. Do you want to uh, elaborate a little bit? I mean, are these the sort of uh, examples of, of corrupt business and the impact that you could see? Or would there, would there be other things that we should be looking into? Oh. I cannot explain better than this example. <laughs> I think this uh, is an extreme example of how corruption can be a disaster, especially for the most vulnerable ones. Uh, and in the fishery industry, we can find the workers are usually not well protected. There might be no, no collective bargaining mechanisms. And even if they are, there are, they might be corrupt in these cases. Or they might have not, they might not have uh, bargaining power against you. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, human rights impact and uh, and corruption, as I said, are very uh, well connected. Uh, for example, uh, for the provision of essential services and for pollution problems, uh, as for water pollution uh, and uh, for the access to energy. Um, for working conditions, uh, we can also see a big connection between forced labor, uh, even human trafficking, and countries with high corruption. Uh, if there is no rule of law, if there is no supervision because it's hindered because of corruption, it's not possible to assure that human rights will be protected. Uh, so we cannot, and the SG, they are all connected. The environmental is, is well connected with the social. We cannot have social well-being without the environment. But the government, the governance part, the G, serves to connect this all and to assure that it can all be, be assured and uh, it can be guaranteed. Without good governance procedures, without anti-corruption procedures, human rights impact and environmental well-being cannot be assured. I can, yeah, yeah. I can just um, add the minor minor example. And this uh, has to do with the the UN Global Compact twenty year anniversary anniversary report, and, and it is a very interesting document because what you see there, the reporting companies, they tend to state that um, policy wise they have done a lot of work. The problem lies not in policy making internal policy make, but in implementation, that's where the, the problem lies. It is very hard to implement policy. And you see that the um, implementation indicators tend to lag far behind policy um, formulation at the company level. And we're, we're just talking about UN Global Compact's reporting companies. We're not talking about uh, the whole gamut of uh, companies which lie outside that, uh, that sample. So that there, there are ve very many remaining challenges with regard to, 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 this, to this, even though I, I do sense from reading that report, from talking to a lot of people, that um, issues of corruption are increasingly connected to, to reputation costs. And so um, businesses with uh, global visibility and the global reputation to protect tend to be far more attentive to to corruption issues than they were 
even 10 years ago. The problem is, again, that we are not talking about um, transnationals as uh, Leviathans. We're talking about a vastly integrated global economy where a single multinational, a single transnational has many uh, different ramifications, very many relations with um, a vast number of suppliers and participants in the in the, its specific global value chain. So it's very hard to to assess the extent to which, even though a, a leader, a driver of a, of a global value chain, is complying with uh, your um, world benchmarking. Uh, W, the, the World Benchmarking Initiative, all those kinds of uh, ISO standards. It is very hard to assess the extent to which it is, even though it's complying, it's actually leading its um, co-participants in the, the value chain to comply as well. So that, that's, that's hard to, to understand. And that I'm not sure that uh, the SDG reporting infrastructure is ready to to help us in uh, monitoring to, uh, to uh, an efficient extent what's happening in the actually existing global economy. So that, that's a remaining a challenge that, uh, that's, that remains, I think. Let's uh, speak about those uh, challenges. I mean, if you had the solution, obviously you wouldn't be sitting here, you would just be a millionaire. Um, but no, I, I don't think, think I, I like to have a humble lifestyle. So. All right. <laughs> But can you offer any thoughts on on solutions that maybe all of you can do that? Just offer, because it is very difficult to implement. Yeah. Implementing policy is one thing. So solutions, that's uh, that's a problem, right? We're, we're kind of good at diagnosing yeah. and uh, offering insights into problems, but uh, solutions are hard to come by. You'll, I would you'll say that- You'll be forgiven for not solving the entire okay. case. <laughs> I would say now. that I would pick up on something that uh, Inej talked about and uh, Johannes also did, which is um, assessing material impacts and not just talking about what my company did uh, with regard to what my annual report from last year said I would do. So the companies, businesses need to be able to present results on their material impacts and not just... And this is a, a, um, a risk that's actually increasing, I think, of SDG washing, which is kind of aligning corporate goals with specific SDGs, so as to say that the, um, my company is exerting an impact because it's um, going in that direction. The problem is that most times it's the business model is already driven to comply with that, uh, to fulfill that SDG. So what I think is... Companies need to, to step up in their uh, transparency work and not just talk about policy indicators. They need to talk about and measure specifically material impacts, not just talk about um, carbon dioxide, but uh, the whole variety of uh, pollutants that they emit, for example. That's, that's just a minor example. So that, that would be a start, which would go far beyond any given existing um, uh, reporting mechanism that is uh, actually existing as of today. Uh, I completely agree with you. And I would just, just like to add that it's very important that companies do not only, it's not only the reports, they have to have mechanisms so that they can prove that what they are reporting is real, that they can prove that they, they say, okay, we. We have a lot of concern to see our human rights impact and to assure we have no corruption, yes. But they have to prove that they have those mechanisms. They have to be able to demonstrate how they do it and have the whole uh, procedure implemented in that sense. Um, another thing that I would like to highlight, it's the importance of the culture of the organization from the management until the first unit. Uh, it's very, very important to start creating a culture of compliance of uh, fighting against corruption and uh, giving a lot of training, showing to every employee what are the consequences of their actions, if they are not compliant, if they are engaging in corruptions, that will bring real impact to people. And sometimes, and I'm not trying to 
to be an ad advocate of anyone, but sometimes those impacts are not that visible. So I think it is very, very important to have uh, uh, to have more um, news on the stories like this, so that the real impacts of corruption can be shown and uh, co the culture of the conduct, uh, the culture of the the companies can be enhanced for anti-corruption cases because sometimes corruption seems like a crime without victims, but it's not. It has a lot of victims, and its consequences are very, very adverse. Yeah, uh, you know, it's always good, you know, I learn a lot from the academics and, you know, it's uh, thanks to the academics and the organizations, you know, it's, I always realize better or better uh, what, how bad it was I was part of. <laughs> so, and I, I'm learning a lot, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I don't actually have much to what uh, you have to say, but maybe from another point, uh, I think it's uh, it's a long time ago. In it's time that you know uh, countries really take on uh, people who break, who are committing this grand corruption. I mean, some people want to say grand corruptions are crimes against the humanity, and you know we have a respect for people and organizations saying that, like uh, just uh, the respectful professor in uh, Kenya, Patrick Lumbumpa. I mean, he says you know, grand corruption is a crime against humanity. So if countries are not taking very strictly on these companies, and they are getting very fairly free away from these responsibilities and accountabilities, then you know they will continue. We need to see much stricter uh, judgments and the prison sentences. We need to see assets confiscated, we need to see penalties, we, we need to see actions because you, like you say, you know, the, the corruption I means we have a lot of victims, you know. We are all just watching in now we have in the official case, tens of thousands of people have been, uh, maybe the levels have been uh, damaged. And, uh, and, but, you know, we see the uh, in Namibia authority, Namibian authorities are, they have uh, people in, in jail, some of them waiting trials for two and a half years, but in Iceland, uh, the Icelandic fishing company is just uh, free and there is not much actions against them, despite the, the, the serious of the crimes and how many lives they have destroyed. Thank you. Ines, uh, you mentioned something quite interesting, because um, as some of you might have realized, me and Jonas know each other from before, the culture of the company and looking critically at the culture of the company. And we've spent many hours talking about the intended chaos that was part of the management of the scheme. Uh, so I thought maybe, Jonas, if you can reflect a little bit on that and maybe um, you will have something to offer because it is, it's not often talked about, but it's an interesting part of sort of these corruption schemes, how disorganization and incompetence actually can become a tool. So Jonas, if you explain a little bit what you realized about the culture afterwards. Uh, I mean, uh, like I said to you earlier, you know, when we are starting in Namibia, I mean, uh, the culture in the company is like that, you know, they are always victims, they are doing so much for others, they should uh, gain so much from this and, and, you know, and you get thrown into this mentality and, and you know, it's like, uh, you, okay, you need to do everything you can do for them because it's such a difficult time, but making huge profits uh, every year. And there is, uh, you know, everything is supposed to be of chaos. You know, if you want to do something well, just with uh, the financials, you know, financial department, you're always stopped by the mother company or the headquarters in Iceland mm -hmm. and the key people, because you cannot have things too much in order. I mean, I sometimes make a joke of it. You know, once I asked uh, for a course in the corporate governance for the staff in, in Namibia, and it's probably the only time there has been a course in corporate governance in this Icelandic fishing company. They, they tried to, then they tried to illegalize, uh, you know, they legalize the illegality, try to have everything in chaos. And there is this uh, atmosphere within the company and everything is tried to be in just few hands because there is so much under for the company because it's definitely not the first time. Because Ines, you mentioned this, like the, how you need to look 
critically, not just this company, we're just using this as an example, but how culture can, it needs to be looked at critically, actually, if you want to do the right thing. I do think that the culture of the organization is very, very important. And it starts from the from the bottom, from the management of the company that has to set what are the values of our organization, what are we trying to, to achieve, and above all, what do we do not tolerate. And when you set this, you need to make a compromise. That's very important. Even you, if your higher performer does something that's illegal, you cannot stand it. If he does do something that is included in your no toleration, you cannot stand, there, stand it. And that's the challenge. That's a big, big challenge for companies. A second thing that is that when you have very large organizations, it's very hard to implement a culture that the management is uh, setting because probably the management will not have any contact with the employees who do the day by day. And those will be key to setting the culture. So the middle management has a very, very important role here from doing the contact from the, the board of directors to the units that are the ones who generate the risk and are the ones who will be more exposed to situations of corruption. Yeah. yeah I, I just want to add one thing, you know, because the company, I mean, I have described the company worth for just as an organized crime syndicate. And, you know, people have asked me if I should have reported this internally first and so on. And my answer is always, you know, you don't work for the mafia and report the crimes to the mafia boss. Yeah. Luis? How, how do I follow up on what? Wow. <laughs> well, I... It's, it's hard to follow up on all what Johannes just said. It's, it's hard, though. Um, the, the question remains, how do... How can we put in place mechanisms of uh, enforcement that are taken up by by very large corporations? This is, this might be feasible, but um, again, going back to, to something that I've been saying for the last few minutes, uh, we live in a global, highly integrated, complex economy. So that that's some kind of a unknown uncharted territory for me so does it make sense to try and enforce some regulatory mechanism that um, puts mechanism puts procedures in place that uh, allow for uh, an um, anonymous confidential reporting that might perhaps open uh, open up the boundaries of the company to external actors does it does that work on a nation by nation basis? Is it uh, regulated by the UN, by the OECD, by the European Union, if it applies, if we're talking about European companies, how does that actually work? How do I, if I, for instance, if I have a, um, a computer development company in, in Portugal, but I uh, acquire semiconductors from Shenzhen in, uh, in the, the PRC, how do I actually enforce compliance from a, a PRC company? How does that work? That's that's something that that's not entirely clear, and it's not necessarily just an academic question. It is, it is difficult. There are certainly solutions. The WTO, the WTO certainly has something to offer, though I, I, I remain skeptical about the the actual capacity of that kind of organization. But the, these are difficult questions. So if a company doesn't have the will, or the it, or the, the resources required to reform itself? How do we force a company to reform itself without um, making it go, go away, just to, to be run down and uh, go out of business? That's, that's, uh, those are difficult questions, I think. So, um, thank you. Um, so uh, there's another thing that I want to ask you, and, and, and again, you are forgiven for not solving everything. Um, uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this project is that we, we see that smaller businesses are often very willing to act in a, in a, in a sort of a responsible way. 
However, they, they struggle with um, how to do it. Uh, and you can always, I mean, you, you go, you, I mean, you go into any environment and you, I'm sure most people want to contribute to uh, um, have, a, have a positive impact, but actually having the ability to do so and also having the ability to counter some of the negative impact that takes um, resources. So one of the things that we've been trying to answer in this project is that how can we, what can we do that takes into account that some companies do not have a lot of staffers and resources that are available, but actually getting started can contribute a lot. So after that long introduction, the question is, uh, what would be the sort of first steps that you would recommend in order to, yeah, in order to um, kind of try to keep on top of this? Well, the first step, I think it will be to take a look in the mirror, uh, to start thinking, asking yourself some difficult questions. Uh, what are my impacts? What are my, uh, am I giving a decent working condition to my workers? What is my water consumption? What is my energy consumption? Uh, how do I engage with my stakeholders? Do I, am I making a good con uh, contribution to the local community? Am I using land from the local community? Am I using, wasting resources? Am I engaging with uh, any suppliers who might have, uh, uh, well, who might have some doubtful working conditions for their workers, even if I do not have, am I engaging with people who do have? Um, I think that can be a first step that anyone can ask themselves. And another thing is, it's a path. It's something that will have to be done with time. It will have to be implemented with time. The first step is to want to do it. It's to recognize there might be a problem and I want to change. And I think small companies have one thing in favor. It's way easier to change the culture of the organization. They, there's a close contact between the management and the employees. There's a bigger sense of purpose. And small companies have a big impact in the local communities. They have a close relationship. They provide essential services. So they might be having a more positive impact than the one that they think. And another thing that they can do is try to understand what am I doing well and try to focus more on those areas to continue to have a positive impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many organizations that do want to help those companies who do not have those many resources. Academia is one of them. There are knowledge centers that do want to help and to provide knowledge. There are business associations that are very engaged with these topics. And there are many resources that are online for free. Some of the questions that I was mentioning, you can Google them and you can find them online to start understanding what can I do different. And this is all free of charge. The, those questions are for free. And I think it's a very, very good first step. Luis, do you want to add before we go to Jonas? Jonas, for you, the question is a little bit different. Like what would have been the, what do you wish you had done before going into Namibia? What would what have been, had been useful for you to ask yourself or, or understand? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, what you also you, you pointed out, you know, is that uh, it's about uh, question about the will. If there is no will within the, the owners of the company or the, or the key management, then uh, it's very difficult for people below to do anything. And it's not like, you know, you get emails that you, we should do this and that. That was never the case. And, uh, and you know, I mean, we... Yeah, we did have a presentation to promise a lot of jobs and put people into the schools, you know, for the to be learning to be experts in the fishing industry and so on. And I tried to implement some of it just when I was there and I did some part and did some minor projects, but there was no actual will from the my bosses. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, yeah, let's put me put it in this way if I knew there was always a bad intent. That bad intention from the beginning, I would probably never have gone to Namibia. <laughs> so, but I think it's always question about the will, and and also how we can force maybe other companies to have that will, 
to show that uh, there is uh, big penalties and uh, stricter judgments and uh, sentences for those who break the uh, break the law. Yeah, and and on that because um, let's let's keep on that. One of the things that I think all of us have a tendency tendency to think is that that we're honest people and we would be able to make the right choice. Hopefully that's that's true, but making the right choice isn't always as simple as people think. So I want to keep the mic on you, Jonas, because one of the more interesting aspects of what I think you've learned and what we've talked about is is sort of how is the realization within that environment you are like the what's it called like the frog that frog that's being slowly boiled and doesn't like you don't fully fully understand the impetus so can you stay on that i mean i know we've talked about it but like being within an organization that now with all the data is it's very obvious that it's a corrupt organization that went into this country with corrupt intentions but can you explain a little bit that journey from trying your, with going in with best intention, then trying to fix the bad intention, and then realizing? Yeah, you see, there is. A, I think I have once said, you know, once you're in, it's difficult to get out because you are suddenly in that position, and you wanted to see good things for the Namibian people. So you stay in this bad position because you know that if you leave, it will get worse for the people. So you are trying to fix or minimize things or, or trying to, to, I mean, like I, I, I just went ahead and, and started a few projects, not really with the approval of, uh, of, the, of my bosses, but it's so difficult just to leave because you know it will get worse. So, uh, and like I say, you know, I mean, you, for a first, my first two years in Ambia, I actually believed we were going to do, build up some projects and we were going to do well, but it was only going to get worse and worse. So you were kind of stuck in the, in the situation. I mean, I think I, I was uh, thinking to leave two or three times before I actually left. Does it answer your question? Yeah, no. I just want to like hear you say it because it's uh, as you can imagine. I, I mean, I I imagine that the two of you haven't been involved in anything like this. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, it's also I mean, keep in mind this is my biggest position in my career, and you're working with this huge fishing company, huge company worldwide, and it is like first it's like uh, this is how the business is done, and you know, and but of course you know there is not exactly like that. But it has an effect. It's half an effect when you are getting part of the company, you're part of the culture. So it takes a little bit uh, time to, okay, you know, this is not right. And the reason why I wanted to ask you on this, this is that it can be hard for all of us. We all say that we support whistleblowers, but actually it can be quite hard to relate afterwards uh, because in order to be a whistleblower, you usually have to be have been a participant. Do you want to comment on this, Jonas? Yeah, I was recently participating in a conference, and as so one lawyer for whistleblowers, he said, you know, every whistleblower is is company made or institution made. Nobody uh, decides when it's a kid that they want to be a whistleblower in the future. But you know, we found ourselves in the situation, so we are actually made from the situation. Any questions from the audience? You're... Yes, Karina, do you want to just stand up and get the mic? Okay, Jonas, if you can repeat the question then for the stream. Ah, uh, yes. Well, it's very, very quick is regarding the impacts. Do you think Sammy knew about the negative impacts? And this is because we don't hear any company saying that I don't want to support human rights or I don't want to support sustainable development. But one thing is to uh, um, undertake corrupt practices or at least play a different game than the one that is written in the guidelines. Another thing is to actually contribute or work against sustainable development and work against human rights. Uh, this was the question. 
you know, I think they're fully aware of the consequences uh, of their actions, and it's all about just themselves. Uh, they are all about to make as much money as possible on the cost of other people. They don't have respect for people. We know that in, in Iceland in the past, you know, they have destroyed uh, fishing uh, villages because uh, they go in with their power by the fishing quotas or fishing companies, take the fishing quotas out of the fishing villages and, and the villages just become empty and nothing because there is no job. So I think they are fully aware but they really just don't care, you know, they don't care for human lives and what the consequences are, you know, they are those kind of people who would never admit any wrongdoings because they are always the victims themselves. They look at it at least like that. I mean, there is often this need to prove intent in criminal proceedings. Uh, do, do you two think that intent applies? here or should we be more focused i mean in when we're looking at the impact and the negative impact should we focus on proving intent or is it more it doesn't matter more the unintended consequences because in criminal cases like this one proving intent is important but perhaps from the practical side it it really is irrelevant when we're looking at the impact uh, maybe I can add something, you know, because you're talking about the intent, you know, <clears throat> this was new for me. I didn't, didn't have this background. And I remember in 2012, you know, the first operational year, uh, it came to my attention that maybe it was good to give the Minister of Fishery, I think, 60,000 US dollar in cash. And, you know, so I gave the message to my boss in, in, in Iceland. And when I called him, you know, his answer was, you know, if you get the opportunity to bribe a minister, you bribe him. Yeah, but do we need to worry about intent or should we be looking at impact in our work? I keep following up from you. This is, this is not easy. It's unfair. <laughs> it's not unfair. It's just uh, not easy. <laughs> I would say I, I'm, I'm hardly a lawyer, so I... Uh, Though I, I think that this is uh, also a question of ethics, and uh, it will, if we're, we can discuss this on a on a legal level, but also on a practical level. So I'm going to stick to the practical level as an activist and as a person interested in evaluating, assessing impact. For my purposes, intent is uh, not necessarily of consequence. Because what matters is the actual consequence of any given action, in this case of a corporate uh, activity. So, for instance, we we're talking about a, about a fossil fuel company, which, for example, the Deepwater Horizon. It is of no consequence to me the extent to which the, the company uh, actively and voluntarily polluted the Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico. But uh, the company might not have maintained the platform to the extent that it, it was actually able to. So the consequence is more or less might be more or less the same. So on a, but of course on a legal level things are different, much different. Um, intent might be necessary for the criminal procedure, yes, but there's also the neg negligence part. Companies can also be held liable for negligence. And if they had the obligation to understand what was happening and they did not, they might be held liable for negligence. Mm -hmm. But uh, for, from the practical side, as you were saying, well, the consequences are there. The company, it, it was impossible that the company did not know what was happening. So from the ethical side, the approval of intent is not as relevant. From the legal perspective, yes, it can be. All right, thank you guys. We are about to close and there's gonna be coffee break, right? Yeah. But 
Okay. There's no, oh, well, the, yeah, thank you. There's a question, so. Yeah, it's for the stream, so. Hello, yeah. yeah. It's a rhetorical question. It's not exactly about what you're talking about. I'm, I'm asking for the other hand. This panel is from um, Impact of Business in Human Rights and Sustainable Development. It's fantastic. But do you have an example of the, the vice versa, the other hand, the impact of human rights and sustainable development in business? When you apply that, understand my question, do you have examples of that? That's a great question. Um, yeah. Well, uh, the consideration of impacts of the company to human rights and, and uh, environment uh, as a big importance for the companies. And I would, uh, I would highlight two dimensions. First, the risk management part. There are the new due diligence rules. You can become a liability for your business partner if you do not have your some process in place. You have the reputational matters. You can have civil liability or even criminal liability. That's one part. Another part is strategy. Doing well by doing good, it's a good strategy. It will bring you customer retention and employment retention. I will challenge you to look at commercials and marketing products and look for the word sustainability in it. And I promise you, you won't have to look hard. It might be a very good strategy for business also. And also for uh, sustainable finance. Sustainable finance is growing. There's a lot of money to be lent. Interest rates are very interesting and it can be very, uh, very, very profitable to be sustainable. And uh yeah, well, I was actually going to talk a little bit about uh, about BSG, but I'm going to give you a, um, an example of a company, a set of companies that uh, actually had to to deal with, with a very tricky situation again with the People's Republic of China. Adidas, H and M, they had they, they're still undergoing a very tricky situation because they. Um, it was found out that in their cotton supply chains, there was cotton coming coming in from the Xinjiang region, and so that that's that remains a very tricky situation. So, and the, um, I followed the situation uh, up to an extent. Uh, at uh, in the beginning, it was clear that uh, no company. I'm I'm focusing on these two, but there are others. But these two companies didn't want to uh, to retain. Um, those suppliers. Problem was that uh, China is kind of a big market for them. So the the risk in um, being disavowed by the by Beijing by the the government was very high. So uh, eventually they decided to remain in uh, in China and try to negotiate a less. Uh, unpalatable solution with regard to cotton. So that's, I, I, to, my, to my mind, that's uh, an example of how even very large businesses need to navigate in a growingly complex situation with regard to human rights and business. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, are you happy with that answer? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, participating. I think we're going to have coffee now and then we'll start again at, uh, in this room at 16.30, right? 16, all right, cheers.
online by Zoom since uh, he got COVID <laughs> last night. Uh, so thank you, João, for, for making yourself available, even being sick. And I will immediately pass on to Gro to start the, the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karina. Uh, I am Gro Skåren Fistro, Special Advisor in uh, Transparency International Norway, which is one of the many uh, national chapters of the Transparency International movement, actually one of 100 uh, chapters. And I think this uh, project that we are doing together uh, is an example of that country to country cooperation, which we are doing very much um, in, uh, in this movement. So thank you very much to Karina and uh, Transparencia Portugal for, for being the host of this uh, international seminar. And also many thanks to my colleague Thud Atli from TI Iceland, who is also involved in this uh, project. So we are now entering um, into the uh, second round table uh, for this afternoon, this evening, uh, where, we are, where the headline is Preventing Corruption and Bribery in International uh, Trade and the Role of Companies. And uh, with me here on the panel, I have three very experienced uh, experts and uh, I'm going to introduce them one by one uh, when they are going to give their first uh, presentation. And so I start with my compatriot, uh, Jonas. Um, Jonas uh, Odne Hogvist is a senior advisor at the Ethical Trade uh, Norway. Uh, in that organization, he's focal point for 25 members, including uh, state-owned companies, construction, infrastructure, transport, and welfare. These are the topics um, that uh, they represent. Uh, he advised in due diligence, as uh, suggested by the uh, due, uh, due diligence guidelines of the OECD. He uh, focuses on procurement and enforcement of the Transparency Act, which is actually a new piece of legislation which is entering into force uh, this week, actually on Friday. So it's very timely that you are here today to, to give us a presentation of that, because I think it has interest also in an international environment in terms of what the companies can do, and, and in fact, what they are obliged to do now. So um, he's going to talk about that. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, Jonas is a specialist, has a special focus on SDG 17, on cooperation, on sustainable uh, procurement in the public sector. He's, uh, in terms of his education and training, he's a Master of Science in International Environment from a Norwegian university uh, called Nuragrik. He has broad experience in environment and climate change issues and uh, responsible business. And he's also been involved with the OECD contact points uh, with cases both in Norway and in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands. Uh, so, Jonas, the floor is yours. I think you have a PowerPoint presentation, which we will get up yes. on the screen here uh, quickly. Uh, Thank if you. We can get some help. Yeah, thanks. So, I, I uh, wanted to share with you uh, the Norwegian Transparency Act, uh, and uh, and I will also try to to uh, be as practical as possible as uh, on due diligence, uh, which this act uh, is about mainly. Um, we might have the uh, PowerPoint over here. Uh, and as Guru just mentioned, uh, it enters into force uh, on the 1st of July, uh, which is uh, in a few days. My second slide here uh, is uh, on the background of why we need due diligence, but I don't think we really need to dwell, delve into that in, after the previous session on, on the fish rot and uh, um, forced labor in Xinjiang in uh, cotton production was also mentioned. Um, so if we just go to slide three here, I can uh, introduce the law, please. Yeah, and uh, just, uh, just say that uh, this new law that comes into effect uh, in a few days was just uh, passed in parliament one year ago, uh, but this is not happening in a vacuum. Uh, as you know, there is our ongoing processes in the EU. Uh, the non-financial reporting directive have been in place for many years, who are um, mandating of companies to do some of the same. Uh, we have the uh, Vigilance Act in France, and we have the Anti-Slavery Act in the UK. 
but Norwegian Transparency Act is the first to uh, truly uh, oblige companies to do human rights due diligence uh, on uh, this detailed level uh, when it comes into force. As you might also be aware, uh, there is an EU process for a, a due diligence directive. Uh, so this might also come into force uh, all over EU relatively soon. Next slide, please. So the full name of the Transparency Act is the Act relating to enterprises transparency and work on fundamental human rights and decent working conditions. Uh, so that's a mouthful, uh, but it's really uh, presenting <coughs> what the law does. And the law is written in a, a relatively straightforward language uh, so that you also as a non-legal uh, scholar can uh, read it and understand what duties uh, are um, applying uh, to the companies. There are really three duties, next uh, slide please, uh, on this law. Uh, the purpose of, of the law is dual. First, uh, to increase the respect for human rights and um, decent working conditions in connection with the production of goods and the provision of services. And secondly, to ensure the general public access to information regarding how enterprises address adverse impacts on fundamental human rights and decent working conditions. So this both towards companies and, and towards the general public intentions in the, this law. You have three duties. Uh, the first duty is for the enterprises to carry out due diligence in accordance with the OCD guidelines for multinational enterprises. So here it is again, the OCD guidelines, uh, which are also linked uh, with or, or taken up uh, the principles of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And the enterprises shall publish an account of how due diligence has been carried out. So you don't only have to do due diligence, but you also have to report and, and be transparent about how you do it. The third du duty is the right to obtain and duty to provide uh, the right to obtain uh, for citizens information and the duty to provide information. Uh, about enterprises uh, measures to seize, prevent, or mitigate adverse impacts to basic human rights. That's the language of, of uh, the OECD due diligence process is it? To, to seize, to, to, to stop all negative effects or to prevent, to, to do uh, preventive work uh, to not uh, cause human rights um, breaches or to mitigate uh, where there are uh, high risks you can, you can set in, um, measures uh, to reduce risks. Next slide, please. And uh, on the process of, of carrying out the due diligence, uh, this is uh, the most uh, central part of, of the work we do in Ethical Trade Norway uh, towards our 180 members, which are uh, businesses and state-owned businesses. Uh, they uh, have already done the first step of the six steps of due diligence, which is anchoring in strategies and in the leadership in the board or, or the leadership group you have to have a, fund, uh, a fundament for doing uh, due diligence uh, and, and uh, implement work to respect human rights the second step uh, are a crucial one uh, where you map your uh, human rights uh, risks for instance in your supply chains if you buy uh, textiles uh, could there be forced labor in the production of those textiles? Could there be uh, cotton from Xinjiang, for instance, or from other areas where there are child labor? Uh, if you are buying IT products, uh, where is the copper coming from? Where is the lithium for batteries coming from? Uh, most likely there are also uh, rights violations in those value chains. And knowing those value chains and uh, going in and, and mitigating uh, our what step three and four are about. Uh, after you have uh, mapped where your risks are, of course, you have to do something about it. Uh, you have to cease, prevent, or mitigate the risks you have found. And uh, step four, you have to follow up. Uh, after you have taken some measures, uh, you need to monitor, do we have the intended change from these measures? Uh, and you need to report, you have to be open about what have we done? Where do we find risks? Uh, and what happened after we put in the measures uh, we made? 
And this is all uh, obliged to go into a public report now, uh, together with the sustainability reporting, which should be given with the annual report. You have to put in your uh, information about your work on human rights due diligence. Um, we should not uh, forget step six here. Um, if you find that there are breaches of human rights or other basic uh, rights in your value chains, you have to either provide for directly or contribute to, um, to remedy. Uh, you have to either, if, if it could be fixed financially by, by paying someone actually because they didn't get their salaries or uh, they're, in other sense, uh, lost uh, a financial interest. You could, you could do that, but also there are several other ways of, of actually uh, remedying uh, damage this time. The extent of the law uh, in Norway are to all large companies, uh, which means uh, about 8,000 companies in Norway, but uh, there is uh, a provision here in, in, in the counting law saying large and non-small companies. Uh, and all non-small companies are companies with more than either two of the three uh, trades, 50 employees, uh, a turnover of at least 70 million Norwegian kroners, which is about 7 million, no, yes, a, a tenth in Euro, so 7 million euros or a balance sheet uh, at the year's end of 35 million or 3.5 million euros. Uh, so that uh, is well below the thresholds of the EU threshold for a large company, uh, as you would know. Uh, so, so this applies to a lot of companies in, in Norway and would also apply to all foreign companies who, are, uh, who want to sell goods either on Norwegian markets to consumers, but also to uh, Norwegian's companies. Thank you, sir. I, I think I'll end the introduction, uh, introduction about the law there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you, Jonas. Uh, this is very interesting. Um, now there's an obligation for companies over a certain size to, to actually do these uh, requirements. What about uh, companies that are smaller? I mean, uh, I guess there will be some uh, influence from this law also uh, for them and, uh, and that it will affect also the small and medium-sized enterprises somehow. So what's in it for them in terms of uh, due diligence and why should they bother if they get <laughs> inspired here? Yeah, clearly there are uh, impacts also for smaller businesses because most smaller businesses are um, in a relation to a larger company that has to report on their value chains and, and the human rights risk in their value chains. And if you are providing a service or, or selling uh, a product to a larger company, you have to be able to explain to them, where did this come from? What are, are the production chain of this company, of, of, of this good? So e even if you don't have to report directly publicly, uh, other companies in the market you operate uh, will ask that information of you. And also with this uh, increase in uh, reporting, there will be a heightened uh, expectation of all companies. So also as consumers, we will uh, be able to expect more from companies. So uh, there will most likely be a shift away from companies that uh, are just generally stating, we don't know what conditions this uh, telephone was hmm. used on. Okay, one last question before I move to the next uh, panelist here, and uh, that is, I can imagine that um, many companies now are struggling and grappling with, you know, how are we supposed to do this uh, due diligence and, you know, what does it actually mean, what does OECD mean here, uh, and prepare themselves. Um, what are the obstacles, you think, in terms of doing a, a due deal on human rights? For the companies that come to us, they mostly have done the first step, which is uh, anchoring uh, fundamental in, in policies and, and top management. And, and then you go on to doing the risk mapping. And, and doing the risk mapping is, is an obstacle because uh, we haven't, most companies haven't really gone into where do we have human rights risk in our value chains before. Uh, because we are going out and, and asking for uh, a product or or a good and 
and the information we mostly are after is the price and maybe the quality of it, but but not the conditions which is it's produced under. So we haven't really uh, built up systems to to handle that kind of information. Mm -hmm. uh, and luckily, there are uh, lots of organizations and institutions that have um, indexes on forced labor and on child labor. Uh, so you can go out and find uh, indexes on, on countries or sectors. For instance, if you are uh, importing cotton or, or using products with cotton, uh, you can find out in what countries are there uh, a danger for of child labor in cotton production. Uh, and then you have to check which countries are we importing from. And maybe you have to ask your suppliers if they are sewing the garments. Uh, you have to ask them, where are the cotton coming from uh, to you? Um, so there are two approaches. You can go from, from the top down, use the indices, uh, to check which countries and there are most risk in, but also you have to con contact your suppliers and ask them questions. Um, so um, we, ha we have to, to get better at, at getting information and, and sorting that information. Mm -hmm. What is your main advice from uh, the organization that you're representing, Ethical Trade Norway? How do you help uh, companies in this respect? Because I think that's your role, isn't it? To be a partner, not to be a watchdog yeah. in this area. Clearly. Um, the advice is you just have to start doing it because it's not very hard. Uh, of course, the expectations are different from big companies, which would have could have a lot of resources to put into uh into this this work and, and smaller companies with maybe five or 15 employees uh, you're not expected to do as thorough as analyze analysis of your value chains uh but you have to do something uh and then you sit down at your desk use in the internet and and, and find some uh indices but also uh use stakeholders contact civil society uh mm -hmm. amnesty ethical trade initiatives, um, transparency for that case. Thank you, Jonas. Um, I will now turn to Julia. Uh, Julia Gracia, is, uh, she's um, working uh, very much in the same field. She's a PhD candidate in public law at the Nova School of Law, which, which we are at now. Uh, she's a research fellow at the Fondacio para a Ciencia e Tecnologia and researcher at the Center for Research Development of Law and uh, Society. She has um, uh, lots of experience. Um, she was a co-founder of NOVA, in fact, this uh, compliance lab and um, a knowledge center aiming at developing research on anti-corruption and compliance. Um, she's a lawyer from Brazil with more than 15 years of experience with litigation expertise and legal counseling for national and international clients. So welcome to the panel. And uh, I know that you are going to talk about the challenges for, uh, for companies in terms of what they can do to, to fight corruption um at the way forward how you see the future but also we are very interested in hearing you know how the compliance lab the nova compliance lab is actually working on these issues so julia please thank you very much gro um well first uh, good afternoon i want this to be more conversation than really an exposition i have taken some notes from the previous panel that i want to share with you um, and I also want to uh, shift the focus from big companies to SMEs, because I believe this is an, a rather an explored uh, area for anti-corruption compliance. If we compare that with all the studies we have for big corporations, and well, I would start with the challenges for SMEs. Some of them have already been mentioned in the previous panel. Uh, although it, it is hard to generalize uh, corruption-related problems to SMEs because it is a very diverse sector, 
and not only um, the, the types of, of uh, firms that um, work uh, as, M as SMEs, but also um, the broad scope of activities uh, they develop more or less uh, regulated. But um, one thing they have in common is data suggests that the smaller the firm, the harder is the impact of corruption in their activities. Um, there are some studies developed by UNODC um, in which they point that uh, proportionally uh, the amount of bribes paid by, SM, by the smaller companies are higher than, this is uh, in proportion, okay, than uh, large, large cap um, enterprises. And this, there are many reasons for that. Um, we can think that, for instance, SMEs, they have uh, more informal relationships. Uh, this can have some impacts, for instance, when we look at conflict of interest, how to manage this com these conflicts, how are the relationships between the employees and, and partners. We can talk about um, how far they understand the hidden costs of corruption. Sometimes they're more um, thinking on the short term than really perceiving that on the long run, they are being affected, losing good personnel or having, um, I don't know, um, employees involved in fraud um, and also losing um, investors' trust. I will talk a little bit about trust as well. Um, and the previous panel has mentioned two issues. Uh, one is um, limited financial resources. We will go back to that uh, again. And also a, a perception of lack of bargaining power when dealing with uh, public authorities. Um, like they, they don't seem to make the difference or how can they fight in, in an environment that is tainted by corruption in, for instance, systemic way. And this is important because sometimes this can uh, imply two outcomes. One could be seen as involving in corruption because uh, SMEs don't find a way to resist but also um, as a means to uh, hamper investment. If an SME wants to broaden the scope of, of uh, where it, it can invest, maybe it will refrain afraid of how to conduct businesses in a given jurisdiction that maybe is um, well known by his high level of corruption. So, well, if I will talk too much. So Okay. Uh, so if we, we look ahead, what can, what, what can we see? I, I want to start by one idea, is that integrity and trust are fundamental or crucial for an economic activity that is guided by sustainability. Um, but uh, we, we, if we look at some, some studies, for instance, the Edelman Trust Barometer has been published, I don't know, three months ago. And the level of distrust has become the default emotion. And we can think a little bit of the implication of, of distrust, distrust on government, on media, and how this can affect, uh, of course, um, democracy, but also uh, the difficulties that is that this um, that this feeling have for um, I don't know for for um, business relationship at large when there is no trust transactions cost rise and also we do not have as much as cooperation as we could and also dialogue is much more difficult. Um, but there is one um, positive aspect of this report is that uh, NGOs and businesses are seen as able to break the cycle of distrust. And if we look at the Portuguese market, it is made basically by SMEs. 
the percentage of large cap companies is insignificant, a 0.1%. So that is why I need, I think we need to focus on SMEs as well. Um, and then um, we have mentioned in the, in the first uh, panel culture. Um, culture uh, in the perspective we, we deal at the Nova Compliance Lab is not just a culture of following rules. We strongly suggest, uh, according to research, that um, this could be seen um, coupled with an ethical culture, a strong ethical culture, because not all the problems that a company faces is solved by the law. The law sometimes, uh, well, not sometimes, the law is reactive. It is, it passed once the problem exists, persists, and then it provokes any kind of damage, and then the law needs to uh, put its hand on its side to, to, to uh, solve the problem. Uh, so when we look at um, ethical business practices, we think of um, ethical decision making. And for that happening, we need a also not only following rules, which can lead us to a simple tick box approach of what the regulator um, demands. I am going to do that, but uh, do we really understand how much uh, my organization can leverage from an ethical uh, business practice perspective. And then I include a good, a strong um, ethics and compliance program. Um, if we look at this just as costs, just as requirements, of course, it's going to be costly. Of course, no one, uh, no, nobody wants to do that. More costs to my company. But again, uh, research suggests that companies, ethical companies, can really have competitive advantage, can become more resilient. And we are, we are seeing what's happening for the last couple of years. We were living a pandemic. Now we're facing a war. We are facing new sanctions. We don't know what will be the new normal. Uh, relating to uh, these uh, issues we have, the impact of climate change. So increasingly, the business environment is um, each day more complex. And companies need to develop a different way of doing things. And that is why we pinpoint values coupled with regulatory compliance as a means to do that. If we look, for instance, uh, to the Etisphere Institute, each year it conducts a study comparing what has been um, the, re the financial result of certain companies, which are the honorees, they are uh, awarded as the more, uh, most ethical companies and then they compare with those with their competitors, which are not. And the last year, uh, what they call the, um, ethics, the ethics premium, um, they have uh, pointed that these honorees outperform 24.6% than their competitors. So when we look at ethics, we can say that there is a ROI, there is a return of investment. But of course, this return is not on the short term. It is on the long, uh, on the long run. And um, so that is the first thing I wanted to, to say, that we need to demystify that investing in compliance program is, is ethics and compliance programs is, is expensive. Uh, I believe that it has been mentioned that today we have plenty of, re of free resources available. We have videos, we have material. Transparency International UK has recently published a very um, th uh, thoughtful guidance about how to combine values and compliance and what is the importance of that. It has been published, I don't know, um, 
this month or last month. So these all are uh, free resources that companies and small firms can look at and can use as benchmarking. Um, and they can also reach out. I want to start, how do I do that? At Nova Compliance Lab, we strongly encourage ethical conduct, business ethical conduct, and, and the positive impact that this can have um, from generations to come, it's not just now. And we have, we offer trainings, we, um, these are e-learning, we, we also have um, opinions published in our blog, we have academic publications, but mostly uh, what we try to do is to, to make this a uh, bridge hmm. between academia, private sector, public sector, that is why, for instance, in our trainings, we have practitioners talking about the practical aspects of um, anti-corruption compliance. We have um, academics as well. And that is what we try to offer. The idea that uh, we cannot work in silos anymore. We need to work together. And we also can think about, it has been very briefly mentioned in the former panel um, about collective action. So um, if we take the metaphor of a small fish in the ocean and all fish together, we can see that um, collective action initiatives to prevent corruption is uh, one way of strengthening good practices, sharing what is really working, and especially understanding what are the problems of the jurisdictions we're in. Hmm. Because sometimes we can mirror what uh, companies, firms are doing in different jurisdictions, but maybe that doesn't apply really to ours. So we need to reach out to peers and exchange information and hopefully build um, a culture of um, ethics and compliance. And for Portugal, and I have finished, um, for Portugal, these, uh, we need to, to grasp the opportunity. We have recently, uh, we, we have um, two, uh, one decree law, and a law of whistleblower, the decree law about the new anti-corruption regime. We, we need to take this opportunity and start to, by learning what has been done in other uh, jurisdictions, com anti-corruption compliance is nothing new. We are having at least 30 years of study of what works and what doesn't work and apply this in Portugal, these winning um, um, stories and success, success cases, I'm sorry. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned many things uh, there, many important messages in terms of, you know, what the challenges are and what, how we can do it, uh, go about it, uh, especially when it comes to collection, collective action between uh, different sectors, but also between different countries uh, learning from each other. And I guess, uh, especially for the small and medium sized enterprises, then, which you said uh, very eloquently, uh, lack the bargaining power. For, for them in particular, I think uh, uh, maybe, maybe it's an incentive for, for this collective action, which you, I know you have done a lot of, of research um, about. So, um, but I, I wanted to pick on one thing that you mentioned about trust and then to build trust, because uh, that is our experience from Norway too, that it's really a problem. Um, this trust element uh, when it comes to the public sector, I mean, sorry, the, the private sector. Uh, we, did, we did a global corruption barometer survey last year and of the different sectors in Norway, you know, most uh, sectors came out with, with a high level of trust, but, but not so much for the business sector. They really have a, a, a way to go when it comes to building that trust uh, because, you know, 28% uh, said that they were using you know private contacts to get uh, co contacts to, to get uh, contracts 
uh, many of the companies they believed uh, were uh, doing tax evasion. So a lot of trouble with trust. So we need to build that trust. How do we do that? Yes, um, building trust is it is one of um, the problems of one of the most studied problems of the social sciences. What I can say is that um, when we think of trust as an exchange, is I, I am talking about trust in relations between our peers, and we can talk about trust as a general feeling. I am talking about to start by building trust in those relationships. And that is, uh, that is when collective action initiatives come to play. Um, one of the tools is in, uh, Integrity Pacts. We, it, can have, um, has, uh, it can have many forms, um, but we can look at Integrity Pacts, for instance, very small projects at we had some in Spain, very small uh, projects in schools. We can look at integrity pacts as in Portugal. It was a very nice project, concluded with huge success for uh, reforming Mosteiro um, de Alcobaça. But we'll, we can look at integrity pacts for systemic change as well. Uh, Honduras has implemented an integrity pact nationwide for changing um, the medicine sector, how to buy, how to pay. So I think integrity pacts and other collective action initiatives, they are very, um, they are not panacea, of course. It is a working progress oh. on and on. And trust is something that it needs to be strengthened continuously because we come from a state of distrust. So this is not something that is going to be solved in one shot gain. This has to be repeatedly worked until it becomes stable. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. I think we can uh, perhaps get back to the question of trust, uh, but, but before that, um, I would like to introduce the last uh, speaker of the panel, uh, Juan Pablo Batalha. Uh, welcome to the panel and uh, nice to see you again. <laughs> we have met before yeah. because um, you uh, were one of the founders of Transparency International in Portugal. So we have met before, but uh, I want to mention that you are a consultant, a columnist, and a lecturer on uh, public integrity, anti-corruption policies, and public participation issues. Uh, you currently serve as vice chair of Civic Front, which is a Portuguese NGO focusing on public interest issues. And uh, as I said, one of the founders of Transparency International here in this country. Uh, where you served at its board. Um, you hold a degree in history with a minor in historical and political sociology from New uh, New University of Lisbon. So I would like to give the floor to you to address uh, this panel on the, the challenges for, for the companies uh, in anti-corruption and anti-bribery. Well, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you grow even if from a distance. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but uh, not as sorry as you'd be if I were, since, uh, as, as Katina said, I tested positive for COVID yesterday. Uh, I, I will also take advantage of this alibi, and if I happen to say something particularly outrageous, I hope you will dismiss it as a product of a somewhat feverish uh, mind. Um, I also want to thank my friends at TI Portugal for the kind invitation and also for, for quickly arranging a solution for me to be able to uh, to be here remotely. Um, I had a few notes uh, that I added on with the previous panel and with this panel, uh, but I'll leave most of it probably uh, out of it because it's been uh, focused already. Um, but I want to add a few things um, on what was already said. Uh, first, we want to talk about the role of companies in preventing foreign bribery. Well, that role seems to be 
very straightforward, do not bribe. Uh, obviously, however, the policy of just say no, as we know from other contexts, uh, is simply not sound effective public policy. So we need to discuss uh, how, how we um, effectively prevent uh, bribery. And I will, I, I will plan to focus on the internal policies that companies should um, adopt and implement, but also on the regulatory framework and the business environment. I will leave much of the internal policies of companies uh, out of it because I think Julie covered that very well. I would like to add to something that she said on the reasons and on, uh, on, on why uh, compliance and ethical investments are good investments. And I think this is particularly true in the case of Portugal, where, as Julia was saying, we have overwhelmingly small and medium sized enterprises. And another reason beyond those that she mentioned uh, to invest in, in, in strong uh, ethical governance systems is that Portuguese companies, as Julia also said, are under um, capitalized, have very low resources. Uh, and this is an obstacle for them to uh, namely do business uh, outside of the country. Uh, and uh, what we are seeing is if we want to promote partnerships between Portuguese companies, smaller companies and international players, international investors, where Portuguese companies may facilitate the entry into markets in Portugal and Portuguese speaking uh, world, uh, Portuguese companies don't have the resources to do that on their own. And so if they want to be able to um, uh, attract partners, international partners, those partners are going to demand strong ethical uh, compliance uh, mechanisms. So this is one of the crucial reasons why it is important for even smaller companies to um, uh, make this investment. But uh, I would like to, to make a larger point about uh, a key aspect of prevention which is repression. And we don't necessarily talk that about, uh, about that a lot. And particularly, we don't really mention that in Portugal. And in Portugal, we've, as Julia was saying, we, we have a new anti-corruption strategy. We have a new uh, uh, legal framework for companies, public and private, uh, in the prevention of corruption that's just come into force. Uh, and there's a lot of focus on preventing corruption, which is uh, uh, the right approach. And I am absolutely uh, uh, in agreement with uh, uh, having preventive policies. But the fact is, uh, a lot of this and a lot of the efficiency of prevention measures uh, has to do with the, our ability to incentivize or decentivize, incentivize good practices and de decentivize bad practices. So if we don't have active enforcement of anti-bribery laws, of anti-corruption statutes, we're not creating the uh, strong enough incentive for companies to do the work and for, for, for them to do these investments. So um, before we go into the, the, the role of companies, which uh, has been very well covered uh, uh, by uh, Julia and, and Jonas, I think there's a cr critical issue, and this is from the Portuguese experience, but certainly not only the Portuguese experience, that we need to uh, be much more active enforcers of, of uh, anti-corruption statutes, because we also see that the impacts of, of, uh, of corruption uh, that we mainly focus as, you know, Western developed companies in Western developed countries uh, um, engaging in corruption in what we used to call the third world and having a negative impact there. Well, the negative impact doesn't stay there. And, and Portugal's experience in the last, I would say, at least 10 years uh, since the big international crisis starting in 2008 is interesting in, in that regard, where we saw uh, uh, a lot of companies with dubious practices in countries such as Angola or Mozambique or even Brazil. We have uh, one of the main Portuguese banks, one of the main Portuguese telecoms at the time engaging in corruption uh, practices in Brazil. And, and, and uh, we can fairly say, well, this is a problem that's happening elsewhere. And there's a, an expression in Portuguese, uh, a terra onde for ter faz como vires fazer, which is to say, when you reach a foreign land, do things the way you see them done. And, and this has been a practice of Portugal 
since forever. I, I think our Portuguese empire, such as it was, was kind of built on that. Uh, to this day, if you want to have a discussion on slavery, for instance, uh, you will see a lot of Portuguese people say, oh, we, yes, we trafficked in slaves, but we didn't invent slavery. It was already there. So we have this notion that uh, uh, even if we have laws and international treaties, that corruption that is engaged in in foreign countries is the foreign countries. And so we do not invest sufficiently in enforcing the laws and rules and regulations here in Portugal. And that is a problem here with the authorities, uh, with the national authorities here in Portugal. Um, and, and then we see that uh, the corruption that we thought was limited to Angola or Mozambique, where Portuguese companies were engaging in, in shady practices, comes back because we saw uh, a, a lot of uh, politically connected players buying uh, uh, stock in Portuguese companies, controlling uh, investments in Portuguese companies. And, and so we, we've engaged or perfected this sort of import-export business of global corruption, uh, where obviously I think, uh, and this was being discussed in the previous panel, there's a lot of responsibility in, in, in what we call the North-South relations. Uh, but the notion that we can keep, I'm sorry for the expression, dumping our trash in some of someone else's country and the, the stench is not going to come back to us is demonstrably false. So um, for now, I just like to, to, to stress this. Uh, there's a lot that companies need to do. There's regulation that's uh, uh, obliging them to do that. But if that's not coupled with active enforcement, then we have a problem. And this is also, uh, and this is my final point, an, uh, an example of the new anti-corruption regime we have uh, in force in Portugal, which uh, uh, mirrors some of what, what Jonas was uh, uh, presenting about um, the regime in Norway, only unfortunately it, it focuses only on corruption and other, not other human rights issues. Uh, but that is to be enforced by a new uh, anti-corruption agency that's to be called the, the anti-corruption mechanism. I have to say I quite like this name because mechanism is the name of the Netflix show that was produced in Brazil about the car wash uh, mega corruption scheme. So we, we <laughs> imported the name for an anti-corruption agency, but the agency is still not uh, created. It's still not uh, in place. And this means that these small and medium-sized companies who are under-resourced and even um, not very much aware of the problem of, and their responsibilities have to start planning the, their compliance systems without this agency in force. And this agency should be already in place to advise, to inform, uh, to uh, give some guidance on uh, how this uh, anti-corruption statutes are to be implemented. And because it isn't, my um, concern is that, again, we will have a merely legislative approach to, to the fight against corruption, where we add laws and regulations and then fail on the enforcement side. Uh, and so, um, again, to start, to, to, to finish as I started, I think a critical part of allowing companies to do the job that we need them to do uh, is to have uh, the enforcement mechanisms uh, to advise them, to help them, and also to make them accountable if they um, violate the, the laws and what is expected of them. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very good, uh, very rich uh, presentation and advice there. Uh, I wonder if you could perhaps uh, elaborate a little bit more on that uh, anti-corruption regime that is happening here in Portugal. You mentioned that there is this, uh, I guess it's not a commission exactly, but uh, an entity who will sort of uh, oversee, overlook this new regime. But, can you explain a little bit more as, the, as to the obligations uh, that, re that is required for the companies? Uh, sure. Uh, I think probably Julia will also have something you, to say on this. But, uh, we have uh, just uh, entering into force this month, one, uh, two different laws. One is the transposition of the Euro EU directive on whistleblowing protections. And the other is this uh, legal legal framework for preventing uh, corruption. And uh, uh, this also establishes 
um, an obligation for companies uh, above 50 uh, workers to uh, map out their corruption risks, to have measures in place to mitigate them or to prevent them, and uh, you know to train their workers and to uh, uh, periodically evaluate progress uh, and uh, review uh, their uh, anti-corruption plans. This is very much um, an obligation created at the image of a similar obligation that already exists for some years now for public enterprises, for public companies and public organizations that have for many years uh, since uh, I think 2008 uh, been uh, obliged in Portugal to have uh, a, a, a specific plan to manage corruption and other ma management risks. Um, but the thing is, again, if we are only dealing with this as a legal obligation, uh, we're not making much progress. I have to say one of my pastimes uh, as an anti-corruption campaigner was when there was something on the news about a criminal investigation regarding any public uh, office for suspicion of corruption or corruption related offenses, I would go to their website and download their, their prevention plan. And mostly what you see there is, is a, a very, I, w I don't want to say bad faith because I'm not that feverish, but um, uh, you would typically see low risk, low risk corruption, uh, corruption of petty uh, employees is in the plan, but the corruption that comes from top down isn't. And so I had this uh, pastime of, of uh, seeing uh, investigations being carried out and realizing that the plans were generally not covering the, the structural corruption, the big corruption. Uh, and that is obviously a problem because it relates to the issue of trust uh, that we were discussing, if people, even people inside the organizations feel that the um, uh, anti-corruption infrastructure is only targeting them, the lower level officials, even maybe the mid-level officials, uh, but not the big risks of, of, uh, of, of, of capture of wrongdoing coming from the top, people will not have trust in the uh, anti-corruption framework. They won't have trust in the whistleblowing uh, channels or the reporting mechanisms. And so we run the risk of, of having a lot of things done on paper that really don't translate to a better uh, business climate or better integrity standards. Thank you very much um, for, to all the three of you for this round. Uh, I wonder, um, I think maybe this also inspired questions from the, from the audience. So if you are burning with something, please uh, give, give me a little hint, yeah? Or you are still thinking? No, no questions at this point. Okay, so um, then I will go back to, to Jonas because um, I think after all, on the occasion of the UN uh, conference, which is taking place here in Lisbon today with the, you know, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, opening the panel and everything, opening the conference, and, and you have this, um, I mean, we have been talking about the nexus between, you know, human rights and anti-corruption, uh, but also environment. Uh, and the ESG has been mentioned by, by several panelists, uh, environment, uh, sustainability and governance. And if I can also quote uh, uh, our chair of the TI movement last the week, she said uh, on a panel on business integrity that, you know, without the G, there is no E or no S. <laughs> so perhaps uh, Jonas, with your experience from, from, from that field, uh, what do you think? Yeah, we, we see um, that, that uh, frequently there's a um, correlation or perhaps more than a correlation between uh, companies that are bad on human rights practices uh, are also tend to be more corrupt. Uh, and they also tend to have very lax uh, uh, approach to uh, protection of the environment. Um, so uh, the, these things go hand, go hand in hand. And, and um, the uh, raw materials sector is, uh, as we saw with fisheries case, is, is especially um, one in danger of, of, of breaking all these trees. Uh, we see it also in mining. 
and that large companies uh, that are uh, at fault for, for not protecting the environment. You find also several human rights uh, uh, breaches, not, not only from the environmental damage they are doing, but also in their uh, production facilities. Mm. Uh, and, and they are some of the, those who are uh, mostly assumed, assumed to be or perceived to be corrupt because the, the, um, um, the court cases are very uh, rare, of course. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, Julia would like to add to that. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, when we look at what would be business integrity agenda, um, it is broader than just anti-corruption. Uh, at least I follow the academic perspective that integrity doesn't equal anti-corruption. Integrity encompasses much more than just resisting bribes and related offenses. And these, then we look at integrity as protection of human rights, environment, and other, other social issues as well. That being said, um, I believe that the problem today still is the very same as with uh, other aspects, um, which are metrics. Um, when, uh, when we, we are academics, we are trained for, um, I mean, trained to uncover the truth. But when companies must self-report their progresses, sometimes they just have to make a summary. And I understand that many of the reports they make must be done in such a way because they need to protect um, themselves from external attacks. They cannot uh, show um, how frail they, they are in certain aspects because it could um, instigate competitors to go against them when they are fragile, where they are fragile. But uh, it then what can, how can we cope both aspects. I would say that there is a need from the private sector to invest in reliable measurement of their progress. Measurement that uh, employs a methodology that is intellectually strong enough to, um, to face questioning. And we see that sometimes, uh, we are seeing that with greenwashing, we're seeing that uh, recently, I don't remember, sorry, which was the bank that has been sanctioned because it has wrongly reported progress in ESG and it, it not exactly what it does. Um, so uh, that is what I will say. We need a more um, strong approach on developing adequate measurement of everything we're talking about today integrity levels, compliance, um, how effective compliance programs are. Most legislations require that compliance programs uh, to be tested, to be measured, the, the progress, the effect, uh, how effective they are. So we need to, to keep pushing to this agenda as well. Not only our oh, self-reporting, self-reporting is great, as long as the regulator has the ability to assess whether or not that self-reporting is accurate, mm -hmm. it is good enough. And I am not sure if regulators have this capacity today. Thank you. Uh, would you like to add to that, uh, Joao Paulo, and, uh, and also perhaps also address uh, you know, which sectors are more vulnerable here uh, when it comes to, to, to these issues? Um, well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, well, I'd say uh, we, among the many problems we have in terms of the makeup of our economic, um, uh, of our economy, um, 
uh, one that's been mentioned is we have too many um, very small and medium-sized companies, and this creates problems for for compliance, for the ability to to invest, to to um, go into other markets, etc. Uh, but we also have uh, another problem, which is the main uh, economic sectors in Portugal have grown under the protection of the state. And often also uh, with the uh, 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 more than protection with the, uh, too much proximity or promiscuity to, to, to the state. So we've seen uh, from basically the 70s and 80s a huge boom in, in the construction sector that was uh, with the real estate crisis uh, uh, went into very turbulent times, but is also now rebounding. Uh, and that has always been associated with a lot of proximity to the to the to the state to illegal party financing uh, uh, as a quid pro quo for urban development licenses from local governments, etc. Uh, a lot of uh, um, overcharging or corruption in public works, etc. And and when we saw Portuguese companies going into other markets, namely in Africa or Brazil, those were the companies. Uh, and so, <clears throat> sorry, they more or less exported, <clears throat> excuse me. My voice is failing me. <clears throat> they pretty much exported the same business model into other countries. And so, uh, obviously, uh, these kinds of integrity mechanisms were the furthest on their mind. Uh, so we have an imbalance of the kinds of, of, of companies that we have doing business in other countries that are the, some of the most exposed to these kinds of risks. Uh, also, the energy sector, uh, the environmental sector, where in Portugal, and not, not just in Portugal, a lot of, a lot of the, the players come from the, the construction sector. And so this is really a problem in a country that never really invested in these uh, mechanisms and compliance mechanisms and internal uh, uh, whistleblowing mechanisms or uh, integrity systems. Uh, and, and so uh, that's why I was focusing on the, 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 the importance of, of uh, active enforcement. But I think it, it remains a policy of uh, most government, uh, well, at least my government uh, uh, and, and the current and previous governments in Portugal, uh, it, it remains the policy to not uh, rock the boat and not make too many waves and not uh, burden companies with uh, these kinds of things. So the laws are, are there, uh, but a lot of uh, penetration of Portuguese companies in markets, namely in Africa, still re relies on uh, personal collect connections that are uh, um, facilitated sometimes often by the, the state itself. Uh, and we've seen cases where, uh, well, we see uh, uh, investigations, criminal investigations on suspicions of foreign bribery languish uh, in, in the public prosecutor's office uh, where they are investigated for years and uh, never develop or, or languish in courts afterwards. And we also see the top political decision makers uh, really not wanting to uh, create problems. We had a, a case uh, of uh, where uh, the former vice president of Angola, Manuel Vicente, was uh, suspected of bribing a Portuguese prosecutor that was investigating him for money laundering. The prosecutor ended up, ended up being convicted. But the case against the former uh, vice president of Angola was um, uh, shipped to, to be tried in Angola under uh, judicial cooperation agreements where we know it will never be tried. Uh, this is bad enough, but we saw at the time the Portuguese president, the Portuguese prime minister uh, actively uh, seeking that uh, dismissal of the case. Because we recognize Angola as a, as, as a, a potential economic partner, and that is above everything else. 
And so uh, I, I would say the problem specifically in Portugal with mo mo most of these issues has to do with the fact that most of the regulation that uh, we enforce here is uh, imported either from the European Union or from the OECD. Uh, and and it, so we are transposing legislation that comes from somewhere else, but really the culture in the political and economic elites, I'm sad to say, is not really uh, uh, in tune with what we are discussing here. And this creates huge problems, obviously, the, the, the impact of all these corruption uh, issues, but also brutally distorts the market uh, because it... it uh, makes it so that the the the, the business environment uh, uh, is skewed towards the incumbents and those who already carved the niche for themselves and it's very difficult for for companies smaller companies or more innovative companies or more clean companies to break out uh, uh, in this environment so i think this is where the issue is not just one of honesty or law enforcement, it becomes really an issue of economic development. If we really want uh, to have uh, sustainable economic development, as Julia was saying uh, in the beginning, we really need to have uh, these systems in place and, and, and actively enforce them because otherwise we are uh, fueling uh, an intrinsically uh, closed set, closed-minded, corrupted uh, business environment that is part of the reason why in the specific case of Portugal, we have languished for about 20 years without meaningful economic uh, growth. Thank you. Um, Jonas, you had a comment to the same uh, line of thought. <laughs> I, I was going to uh, say something about self-reporting, but, but after this, uh, uh, rather strong, um, uh, explanation about uh, the culture and 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 the, and the meaning of or, or or the influence of it in, in Portugal. It, it feels uh, uh, going a, a bit back. But uh, from what you say, uh, what regulations you have are, are imported from uh, the EU or, or the OECD? I think there are uh, signs overall in, in uh, among market actors uh, that hopefully could influence um, Portuguese uh, companies as well. Um, I was uh, thinking especially of the financial sector, which is uh, one of the foremost now in EU driving this, uh, and, and on uh, self-reporting. Uh, I, I do agree in completely that it's, it's, not, uh, uh, it's, it's not enough, it's not, it's not a full tool. Uh, but in this field, uh, just getting information has such a higher cost in, in just in, in, in the work it takes to get specific information. Uh, so especially in the climate field, uh, there are a lot of information now from self-reporting. Uh, and uh, there's been uh, complaints that it's not standardized, so we don't know everything, even though there are self-reporting. But this gives a much higher level of um, just knowledge uh, to uh, scrutinize a company. Are they doing anything at all? Are they doing what they are saying than not having the self-reporting? Uh, and also with the increasing demands from the financial sectors due to, uh, amongst others, uh, regulations from the EU, uh, this will improve. And it, this will also spread to other new fields. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a case to be made that there is a positive development in reporting and information flow from the companies uh, that will also um yeah lift uh, most of the market uh but um of course th there are real uh, challenges here in um false claims in self reporting or uh, bad will uh bad, in bad intent uh and and this uh, goes to cultures in uh company management company leadership com company ownership and which is connected also to, to country elites, political elites. So um, there, there, there needs to be a system change, not only a reporting change, of course. Hmm. 
Thank you. Uh, there are lots of uh, good input here and uh, many takeaways, I think, from for the audience. Uh, but I think especially, and uh, un unfortunately, time is flying. So I think we have only time for just one quick round. And we always say, you know, when it comes to preventing corruption and anti-bribery, that there is no silver bullet. But nevertheless, uh, <laughs> I'm going to challenge you on that and give just one takeaway, quick takeaway to companies as to what they can do uh, themselves um, from this seminar. Uh, should we start with Julia or I, mean, because, <laughs> I think it's your turn to speak. Well, my takeaway of course is retail collective action initiatives. I think especially for SMEs, um, this is a, these are different fora where they can bring their concerns learn best practices. We need to foster that in Portugal as well. Um, I know that there are other jurisdictions that have um, collective action initiatives for, for SMEs and, and we can have mentors, a large cap, a mentoring, smaller ones. So I think this is a field that is worth uh, taking into consideration how the, the business sector in Portugal is made basically uh, of SMEs is worth investing. Great. Uh, João Paulo, your turn. Um, well, it, it might have looked as I was uh, advocating armed revolution earlier, but <laughs> really that was not the case. I, I think the, what we've been discussing, the, the self-reporting mechanisms, uh, these plans, action plans that uh, companies are mandated to develop are a good thing, undoubtedly. I mean, even if they're bad plans and not properly implemented, it's better for a person like me to have that pastime of, of uh, checking the plan against the, the reality than having no plan at all. So this is really important. Uh, and I would uh, I totally agree with what Julia just said. There is, especially in contexts such as Portugal, where companies are, are small and under resourced, there are there is help that can that can uh, contribute to 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 sound implementation of these things and and to make these investments that they are legally mandated to do anyway sound economic investments and i would add just one thing which is something about uh, management culture it is critical that companies understand and this is i think is also a problem here in portugal that everybody in your company or around your company has a stake in it uh, and and you need to to be able to hear them and to and to have their input and and to build feedback loops that your your employees even the lowest employees can talk to you and can not just report wrongdoing, but but uh, uh, come up with new ideas and and so we we need uh, and this is from a Portuguese perspective le less hierarchical companies. Where, where people can feel that they have a voice, not just in reporting wrongdoing, but uh, in, in the forging the, the road ahead on, on all of these issues, not just the business itself, but in, in the sustainability of the, the business and environmental issues and human rights issues and anti-corruption issues. Yeah, Thank you. We agree on a lot here. So okay. I, I just want to echo that uh, seeking out like-minded uh, it's very important in this field, uh, either if there are formal organizations or places to meet already, or just finding someone that, that has the same processes as you, and, and you can strengthen each other by, by discussing uh, how to deal with anti-corruption or with uh, respect for human rights, and, and uh, properly anchoring it in, in the culture of your organization, or of your business. Is important and it, it has to start on the top you have to put it into your policies and and have the leadership or, or the board approve this this is our line now and and then you have to communicate it through the company it's it's not enough to have a policy on your website you have to let all the employees know and and the middle management all the way and uh, that this is how we are going to do it and show that this is the way you're going to do it and then you implement the culture in, in your company um, Thank you all, Joa Paolo, Julia, and Jonas, uh, for very good insight and sharing of experiences. The tone from the top, I think we agree on. And uh, let's also agree on uh, zero tolerance for corruption, but not zero discussion. We should continue to discuss this, I guess, in many seminars and, and be of really good help for the companies for business integrity. So thank you so much.
So we will continue uh, the, the session with the closing remarks. Um, yes, joining me uh, in the stage will be Monica Angelo uh, from the Grants Portugal. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Monica Angelo. Um, everything, uh, after everything that I have learned and hear here today, I think that uh, even though it's up to me to make the final remarks, um, I think that anything that I can say will be absolutely shallow. <laughs> so, but as a national focal point representative of the EA grants in Portugal, um, I would like to say that it's uh, a great pleasure to have joined this international seminar in such a, an important and current theme. Um, I would like to uh, begin uh, sending our congratulations to Transparency International Portugal in the presence of Karina Carvalho, Thank you. Uh, João Oliveira and Martinha Agares uh, for overcoming the challenges brought, brought by the COVID pandemic context in the last two years and especially for um, the capacity to adapt, to carry out so successfully this important initiative in this. I have a few notes um, that I would like to, to say. Um, in order to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels, the UN Agenda 2030 asks all states to substantially reduce corruption and bribery in all their forms. As stated by Transparency International, the economic repercussions of these practices triggers unfair competitive advantages and results in fewer public services for the people who need them most, like we have uh, heard here today. Also, as, as um, has been widely discussed here, Companies can play the most, the, the, the utmost relevant role to fight corruption practices by promoting truly engaged corporate social responsibility, and they are indeed a key stakeholder to effect change. We at EA Grants emphasize how pleased we are to have approved funding to support this bilateral work uh, between the chapters of Transparency International in Portugal, Norway, and Iceland. Um, and uh, leave the note that as binding principles, all programs and activities funded by the EA grants shall be based on common values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and the respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities, and shall follow the principles of good governance, be participatory and inclusive, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective, and efficient. As a rule, there is zero tolerance towards corruption. For those of you that are not yet familiar with EA grants, I would like to uh, ex explain a little further. EA grants is a seven-year uh, financial mechanism uh, that results from an agreement uh, in the European Economic Area. It was signed in the city of Oporto in 1992. Uh, between the member states of the European Union and the three of the states, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. And uh, uh, it is agreement, uh, this agreement uh, grants their participation in the European Union internal, internal market. The parties to this agreement created this financial mechanism known by EU grants and uh, with two major objectives, to reduce economic and social disparities and to strengthen bilateral relations. The current period of the grants in Portugal supports five programs in five different areas. We have blue growth, environment, culture, work-life balance, and civil society, and also a special fund that promotes bilateral relations, the fund for bilateral relations that is uh, operated uh, directly by the national focal point. 
The strengthening of bilateral relations between donor and beneficiary countries is the hallmark of TA grants. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an objective that, uh, in addition to economic and social cohesion, is of equal importance. In, in general terms, it is important to say that we are uh, already halfway through the implementation of the current uh, financial mechanism, which, although is designated 2014-2021, it will close in 2025. The Fund for Bilateral Relations uh, has an allocation of about 3 million euros, and they've already selected 59 bilateral initiatives in many different areas, from education to research, public policies to performing arts, environment to innovation, including, including this Clean Bees um, initiative. Recently, it was agreed with the donor countries to reinforce this fund. Um, and uh, this shows the, the importance that uh, the, the bilateral relations have to EA grants. On July 1st last year, a new call was opened to finance uh, bilateral initiatives between Portugal and Norway um, in any area, but with a proven innovation component. On the joint website, if you, have, if you are curious, in the joint website of EU Grants Portugal, you can find information about all our programs and projects supported. Um, as well as the funding opportunities that we still have available. We also suggest also uh, suggest that you can follow us on social, uh, social networks where we daily give notice of uh, everything that happens in EA grants and uh, in our supported projects. Just to finish, I would like to leave the note that about one week ago, the negotiations between um, the beneficiary countries, namely Portugal, and the uh, three donor countries uh, have finally begun to the next funding period for the EA grants. And we hope that they can uh, swiftly reach uh, the end so that we can continue this important support to Portugal. Um, working together for a green, competitive and inclusive, inclusive Europe is the, the slogan of the EA grants, but I think that somehow resume the spirit of everything that has been said here today. So finally, I would like to wish you success, to thank you, and to say that we eager to um, know more and to, to, um, to know more about the impacts of the Clean Bees Initiative. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. Uh, we also thank you, the ones that are listening and seeing us uh, through Facebook. We hopefully uh, expect that colleagues in Norway and Iceland and all over Europe and elsewhere are also assisting and attending the, the event. Um, a big thanks to, to, to TI Norway and to TI Iceland and all the stakeholders that we were uh, uh, able to meet in both countries. Thanks to my colleagues at TI Portugal and the founding members and the board and everyone that helped us. And especially thank you to EA Grants for supporting us. And we think that it, this is just a kickoff for, 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 for more to come. And also thank a big thanks to, to, to Nova Compliance Lab, Nova uh, Center for Business, Human Rights and Environment and the school for hosting uh, this event. Hopefully it's not the last time that we are here. Uh, so thank you and see you around. Thank you so much. I was trying to see.